I wanted to talk briefly about three different organizations that define SSD. So the first that we talked about was ASHA, okay, which is our governing body. And we're primarily going to use their definition for our purposes. ASHA is who puts out the chart that we discussed that differentiates between organic disorders and between functional, or what we said another word for was an idiopathic disorder, okay? But there's two others. So one is you'll find a definition of a speech sound disorder in the DSM-5, okay? The DSM-5 is a literal book, and it's published by APA, the American Psychological Association, and it stands for the Diagnostic and Statistic Manual of Mental Disorders, and it's the fifth edition. So you might ask, why is a book that's used by psychologists and social workers um, have a definition for a speech disorder? And I want you to think about all of the things that we think of as you know, mental disorders, things like anxiety or depression, okay? Um, historically, those have been kind of hard to study, and they've been taken less seriously because you see them by their symptoms, but oftentimes there is not something on a scan or a blood test that you can use to diagnose them. We diagnose them through behavioral symptoms. And so the DSM-5, even though it has all of the definitions for you know, mental type diagnoses, it also has definitions for developmental diagnoses like speech sound disorder, okay? So if you remember in that kind of dichotomy from the ASHA, if this is our idiopathic, and this is gonna be our organic, the DSM-5 is really just going to focus in on this idiopathic speech sound disorder because we're diagnosing it based on the symptoms we see, not because of some kind of underlying uh, anatomical or physiological problem, okay? The reason why I bring up the DSM-5 definition is you, when you look at the slides, you can kind of compare and contrast some of the things you see in the ASHA definition. So they're both agreeable to the fact that this disorder occurs in children, it starts in childhood, okay, and it has characteristics that impacts the sounds of the language. And in the DSM-5's definition, they talk about how sounds can be substituted, omitted, distorted, or added. And you may remember this from your phonetics class, but this acronym describes some of the sound changes we might see uh, in a child who has a speech sound disorder. Okay, um, the last kind of governing body that we'll see is created by the World Health Organization. Okay, so this is going to be global. And they publish these codes called ICD-10, okay? The International Classification of Diseases, 10th edition. And how it's different from the DSM-5 is that it has diagnoses for everything you could ever imagine. Medical, cognitive, developmental, mental, everything. It's incredibly thorough. Um, and the reason why I bring it up is that we use ICD-10 codes in clinical practice for billing, okay? So we're gonna read the definition of a phonological disorder for the ICD-10, and you're gonna see how it's similar and different from the ASHA definition. But even though ASHA is our governing body, every single insurance company uses these diagnostic codes um, so that we report on what a child has so that they'll pay for it, okay? So that's why I bring up the ICD-10. Um, so ICD-10 also agrees upon the fact that speech sound disorders occur in children, but they have different codes for kind of different types of SSD. The one that we're reading on the slide indicates that it's a speech problem without any associated language problems or without any associated uh, genetic disorders. So there would be a different code for a speech problem with a language disorder or a speech problem that's related to a genetic disorder like Down syndrome, okay? 
So we're mostly going to focus on the ASHA, but I wanted you to be aware that this governing body also puts out a definition because we use the codes in billing. All right. So the other thing that the World Health Organization puts out is a framework called the ICF framework. And I don't know if you guys have ever heard of the medical model of disability, but it basically is a simplistic model of health and disability that says you have a diagnosis, that's what's wrong with you, you go to the medical system to fix it with some kind of drugs, um, and then if they treat it with medication or whatever it may be, or surgery, then you're fixed, you're cured. We've moved away from that model for a lot of reasons to what we call a social model. And a social model is different because it recognizes no matter the severity of the underlying diagnosis, you can have impacts on your daily life, right? So you can have an impact on your ability to go to school or go to work. It can impact your ability to interact socially with others. And so somebody who has even a mild disorder can have a pretty large impact on their day-to-day -day life. So if we draw out this ICF model, okay, the first thing that it's going to look at is impairments in body structure and body function. So we're going to use more of a medical type disorder to talk about this, but let's say you had diabetes, okay? The body structure that's impaired is your pancreas, and it's not producing insulin like it should, okay? So then we can talk about how that affects your activity level. So activities are things you do by yourself. It is a task, it's a skill. So for example, because your pancreas doesn't work effectively, that might affect your daily activity of eating a snack, or it might impact your daily activity of getting ready for work because you're going to have to stop and check your blood sugar and you might be late for work because you have this new task to do. It might affect travel, okay, because your blood sugar might not be stable enough to travel far away or you may not be sure of foods that you'll be able to eat once you get there, okay? So those are activities that you do um, on a day-to-day -day basis and we kind of differentiate them. They're things that you can do by yourself. Then we look at how that diagnosis can affect your participation. And participation has to do with our social interactions with others, group type activities. So if eating a snack or eating a meal, an activity is now more complicated, then that might affect my ability to go to a restaurant with a group of friends, okay? If eating snacks or meals is a little tricky for me right now, that might make um, a work meeting where they're serving breakfast a little more complicated, okay? Where I have to participate with other people, okay? Um, so participation has to do with social interaction, things that we do with others, all right? So then down at the bottom of your chart, I'm not gonna draw out all of the, how it looks uh, exactly, but we have kind of two separate factors and one is environmental factors and the other is personal factors. So environmental factors are anything in your environment that makes your perception of your illness or disability better or worse, okay? So if we're going back to the example of um, diabetes, if in your environment you have access to grocery stores with healthy foods, if you have the financial resources to buy those healthy foods, um, if you have friends in your environment who work out and eat healthy, um, if you have, uh, you know, family members who you regularly, you know, go running with, then your perception of your disability might be a little bit better, okay? Because you have a supportive environment, okay? You have, uh, you're not going to have to make a whole lot of changes to your lifestyle, okay? Another part of environment could be people's attitudes, 
Okay, so if you have a supportive friend group or a supportive family group who, um, you know, people who can take you to the doctor or take you to the hospital, um, who encourage you, um, that can be a positive environmental factor. Okay, but if we have the vice versa, let's say that in your environment, um, you have friends who eat out a lot and they don't eat healthy. Um, you have friends who have sedentary hobbies. Maybe you don't have a supportive family who will take you to the doctor. Um, maybe you have really negative attitudes about diabetes. So maybe the people in your community think that diabetes is just caused because you're healthy, you're, excuse me, you're unhealthy and lazy. Um, and that's going to be really discouraging. And that's going to make your perception of this diagnosis much, much worse. And it's going to really reduce your quality of life. Personal factors are anything unique to you that once again improve or worsen your perception of that disability. So if personally um, you have a really good outlook on life, if you're you know open to new challenges, if you are um, you know okay with making lifestyle changes, then that's not super difficult for you. Um, things like maybe you're not afraid of needles, right? Maybe you um, maybe you like certain healthy foods, right? Those are personal factors that are unique to everybody um, that are going to make your perception of diabetes maybe better. But if you um, have another diagnosis, so maybe in addition to diabetes, you have depression, right? Maybe you're afraid of needles or afraid of doctors. Um, maybe you don't have a positive outlook. Um, those things can really um, affect your perception of, of the disorder and the impact it has on your day-to-day -day life. Um, with personal things, this could also be what we call comorbid disorders. So do you just have diabetes or do you have other medical disorders that are occurring at the same time? Um, it could also be things like your sex, your race, um, how people in the world perceive you, okay? Um, so, for example, we have um, some pretty good um, research studies that support that people of color are, have poor outcomes in the American healthcare system. And so, perhaps because you're black, you are less likely to seek out healthcare because there's a mistrust there. So all of that falls under these personal factors.